This is an episode of Reasonably Sound Classic. For the first 30-some episodes, this podcast was distributed by Infinite Guest, American Public Media's podcast network. Thus, it benefited from blanket broadcast licenses held with every music publisher. After going independent, pretty much all intro, outro, and interstitial music had to be removed. The intro and outro music you're going to hear is an in-progress version of Reasonably Sound's theme, written by Will Stratton. The awkward silences are where act break music used to be, so if you could just imagine like Queen or The Misfits or Kate Bush along the way, that would be great. If you want to support Reasonably Sound in the hopes that maybe one day I'll be able to afford some blanket licenses of my own, you can check out the Patreon at patreon.com forward slash reasonably sound. Okay. On with the show. Hey everybody, before we get started, two small bits of business. First, I'm just getting over a really terrible cold, so if I sound nasally or crazy, I apologize. And second, in the last episode of Reasonably Sound, Snicked, I incorrectly attributed the sharing of a link about the sound Godzilla makes to my internet pal Brian Fairbanks, whose name is actually David Fairbanks. David, I'm very sorry about that, I promise. To never let it happen again. Okay, on with the show. It's pretty frequently that my girlfriend, Molly, will ask me to pick favorites. She really likes the idea of favorites. Favorite part of a recent vacation, favorite movie, favorite this, that, and every other thing. And I, I am, I will admit, I'm pretty bad at picking favorites. I might even be a little against picking favorites. My sense of relativism runs so deep that I have no shortage of anxiety when asked to name the thing that stands above all other things in any one category. I always become racked with guilt, a fear. Can I change my favorite later? Is that allowed? Or I feel the need to excessively qualify with stuff like, well, I mean, I mean, this is my favorite right now, and, you know, I've been feeling this way recently, and so that's probably why I like this at this point, and later when I feel another way, and so on and so forth, until my waffling causes the people who have asked me about my favorite beer or Doctor Who episode to completely lose interest because, man, they had no idea what they were getting themselves into. So I bring this up to provide some context for the idea of having a favorite sound. I feel, because of an expectation I've perhaps, and almost certainly, invented for myself, not because of any real presumption of responsibility by others, that I should have a favorite sound. One favorite sound. That when someone asks me what my favorite sound is, I should not only be able to respond immediately and with confidence, but with reasoning that would show to this person beyond a shadow of a doubt why this thing I have chosen as the best sonic experience above all others deserves to be so. Except I don't. I mean, not really. How does one even qualify favoriteness? Like, what is the criteria that something must fulfill in order for it to be placed under such a superlative designation? Maybe you're now starting to get a bit of an insight into why I have such a hard time picking favorites. Anyways, there are three sounds, not one, that whenever I hear them, the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. There are lots, actually, and we're going to get back to that in a second, but for some reason, these are the three that come to the forefront of my mind whenever anyone asks, Hey, guy who thinks about sound lots, what are your favorite sounds? They are the sound of a Snapple bottle opening, the sound of an orchestra tuning, extra points if a couple instruments are noticeably out of tune to begin with, and the sound of a breaking, incandescent light bulb. I wish I could say what it is about these three sounds, all of which are very different, that causes me such enjoyment in hearing them. 
it's almost like a precognitive thing that happens. As, I mean, as far as I know, consciously, I have no associations with these sounds. I have no memories or particular instances of experiencing them that come to mind, that come uh, flooding back whenever they occur. As far as I can rationalize it, uh, there's just something buried deep within my brain that recognizes these sounds as pleasurable. These sounds and a bunch of others. See, I, t ugh, I told you I was bad at favorites. I can't even pick three. Anyway, this brings us to this thing you may have heard of. You may not. I mean, it doesn't technically exist, except in the minds of the people who experience it, which, I mean, if that's not existence, then what is? Anyways, it's called ASMR. ASMR stands for Autonomous Sensory Meridian Response. According to Wikipedia, it is a neologism for an unproven, scientifically unsupported, neurological slash perceptual phenomenon whereby people experience involuntary tingling or mild euphoria in response to certain stimuli. That stimuli can be tactile, visual, olfactory, or, you guessed it, sonic. At its most bizarre, I've heard ASMR referred to as a head orgasm or brain gasm. I'm doing really big finger quotes in the studio right now. But most people who experience it, myself included, describe it far less extremely as a simple yet strange sensation that occurs at the top of the head, back of the neck, or base of the spine. And it happens in response to, well, this is actually one of the interesting parts. It's different for everybody who has ASMR. That's what the autonomous in autonomous sensory meridian response means. The, quote, triggers, as they're called for people with ASMR, are different for different people. There are common categories, though. Sounds which are soft and quiet, activities done slowly, methodically, or expertly. For instance, lots of people identify Bob Ross and his paintbrush as the first thing to ever trigger their ASMR. Now, probably one of the simplest mountains to make and also the most popular is the little snow-covered mountains. Now, take the knife, you have that little roll of paint on there, and push very hard, very hard. And all you're trying to do here is push in a basic shape, just a very, very basic shape. The only thing that you're worried about at this point is this nice outside edge. You could care less what's happening in here. Anything can happen in there. We don't care. All right. It's not so much personal preference as it is then personal affect, which makes sense given that they're called triggers. Though, and this is a digression, so we'll cue the music, in other quarters of the internet, the word trigger has other definitely much less sunny connotations. Triggers are words or phrases, ideas, or even types of media which, as Urban Dictionary puts it, quote, emotionally set someone off, could refer to anger or reliving a traumatic experience. Most often, especially on sites like Tumblr and LiveJournal, discussion or portrayal of things like sexual assault, murder, suicide, and bigotry are considered triggers. People provide trigger warnings for content about terrible and heinous acts which might suddenly send someone into a panic attack. The idea is that these things are outside of us, but also, in some sense, in us. They have some level of seeming control. They're out there in the world. They're forces which act upon us in a way that is involuntary, maybe even instinctual. Now, a trigger is a device, or a thing, that begins a course of action. But so can a button, or a switch, a lever, a spark, a nudge, a force, a jolt. But we went with trigger. A trigger is instant, it moves at the speed of sound, maybe faster, and a trigger is final. You cannot untrigger a trigger. Once you've pulled it, the trigger is pulled time to deal with the consequences, which, in the trigger's most popularly known use attached to a gun, aren't exclusively beneficial. It's probably for this reason, the relationship to trauma, that I always found trigger to be a strange term to use in conjunction with something like ASMR. 
though I suppose to call them ASMR sparks or jolts, would only heighten its already vaguely and mostly winced at New Age aspects. So, but anyway, this is all to say, who knows, maybe there are sounds out there that you haven't heard, or images you haven't seen, or activities you haven't witnessed, where if you do eventually hear or see them, there'll be this part of your brain that goes, oh, hey, that's neat, in a way that's very hard to describe. And so, as a result, and as you might not be surprised to learn, an ASMR media complex has emerged. There's a reasonably sized community, especially on YouTube and sort of by extension on Reddit and Tumblr, producing content with the aim of triggering the autonomous sensory meridian response in its audience. The media created, mostly video, ironically, features a host engaging in activities which produce classes of sounds well known as triggers. They might drum lightly on a cardboard box. They might tap their fingernails on a plastic surface. Or rub two objects together. They might pluck at the teeth of a flat hairbrush. Or maybe even just pour water. I really like a YouTube channel called Sound Sculptures. Here's a short clip of a recent video where the host, whose hands only ever appear on camera, plays with a large chunk of glow-in-the-dark silly putty. A large, and the most visible, literally and figuratively, selection of ASMR media creators whisper while they busy themselves with other hopefully triggering activities. Though, for some people, the whispering itself is a trigger. Like, here's the YouTuber ASMR Requests talking about an issue of the Serenity comic book. This one. It's called Leaves on the Wind. Joshua Hoodleson, in a post for SoundStudiesBlog.com, goes so far as to collectively name this the most well known and significantly female community of YouTube ASMR practitioners as whisperers. And what they provide is something between entertainment and service, assuming you don't consider entertainment a form of service, I guess, which maybe you do. The entertainment aspect is, granted, sort of specialized. If you're not the kind of person who considers watching someone manipulate, say, a leather calendar folio while breathy word shapes barely escape their lips as meeting even the loosest definition of entertainment, then okay, fair enough. But the other half of the duality, the service portion, is a little bit more concrete. Many people who have ASMR, and even many who don't, find these videos, or more specifically the soundtrack to these videos made by whisperers, to be ideal sleep aids. They help them relax, calm down. Some people have reported that these videos ward off panic attacks or reduce chronic anxiety. In other words, these videos provide triggers which can counteract the effects of other triggers. Why is that, you might be asking? Why does something as specific as a video created to cause a not actually proven perceptual response in a small subset of the population also work as a soporific for those suffering from sleeplessness or anxiety? Well, to answer this question, 
we have to talk a little about American telephone advertising from the 70s. Just for a couple minutes. In the early 70s, the telecommunications giant AT&T was the subject of growing public and regulatory concern regarding their mighty control over American telecom infrastructure. Eventually, in the early 80s, they'd be ordered by the U.S. government to surrender ownership of the Bell Operating Companies, the companies that actually provided the practical aspects of telephone service to most of the United States. The antitrust law that mandated this also actually included important telecommunications law still in effect today, some of it's even playing a hand in the current American net neutrality debate. But that's besides the point. What's directly on top of the point is that before the lawsuit and the Bell breakup, AT&T wanted to improve its image. And along the way, if they could, convince people that long-distance phone calls were totally worth the price and a thing they should definitely do. So AT&T hired the advertising firm of N.W. Ayer and Son, coiners of the famous Morton Salt slogan, When it rains, it pours, and De Beers' seemingly indestructible, A Diamond is Forever. Now, as it turns out, according to Nancy Friedman in a 2011 post for VisualThesaurus.com, at around the same time, famous sociologist and media theorist Marshall McLuhan, who you might know from The Medium is the Message fame, had regular gigs speaking on the importance of media and technology at big companies like AT&T. Earlier in the same decade, McLuhan wrote a book with Barrington Nevitt, an engineer and also media theorist, called Take Today, The Executive as Dropout. Much of Take Today is about, well, here, I'll let it speak for itself. The inside jacket summary reads, The world's managers have failed to adapt to the age of speed up. They persist in their hardware thinking. They are relics of the industrial world of assembly lines and visual space. They become diehards holding the old management fort. There's lots of talk of technology influencing the pace of business and the changing nature of information flow and power dynamics and interpersonal communication in a technologically mediated, increasingly global work environment. And to this last point, on page 223, McLuhan and Nevitt write, With telephone and TV, it's not so much the message as the sender that is sent. It is not so much the receiver who gets the message as the receiver who is brought simultaneously to the originating point of the message. The paradox is that in the age of hardware, the message was relatively light and abstract. In the age of electric information, that which is transmitted or transported is both thing and person. Nancy Friedman, in that same visual thesaurus post, connects the first part of this passage to McLuhan's ideas about the, quote, tactile power of communication technology, meaning beyond sending electronic blips back and forth between devices plugged into a wall, we're also augmenting the possibilities for and capabilities of meaningful human contact, maybe even to the point where it could be considered almost physical. So what does this have to do with AT&T and N.W. Ayer and Sons, you might now be asking? Well, so... At around the time Marshall McLuhan was on his apparent corporate speaking tour, the slogan which the imaginative employees of Ayer eventually penned to soften AT&T's image, to communicate the importance and intimacy of a phone call, and which would go on to become one of the most well-known and recognizable features of 20th century advertising was... Reach out and touch someone. When a faraway voice sounds as close as you feel, that's reach out and touch someone. That's AT&T. Reach out and touch someone. This is, in some sense, what all creators of ASMR media hope to do. To use some concert of sound and technology to create a physical sensation. Doubly so for the whisperers. In many whispering videos, there's an undertone of favor or of 
care that the person on screen is there to provide their audience with something to help them unwind or get drowsy or bliss out. They've created this media knowing, or I guess hoping, it will affect viewers in some way. And so there's a prevalent subtext of nurturing, even sometimes motherliness. There's an undeniable intimacy that comes with hearing someone's voice at close proximity, and whisperers reproduce that intimacy with great effect. And one definitely does not need to have ASMR to feel it. Elsewhere, in Take Today, McLuhan and Nevitt write, The telephone permits kissing, if not visualizing. The phone is an audile, tactile medium. Maybe what they mean here is something along the lines of ye old radio is the most visual medium, but augmented with this idea of touch. The sound produced by the telephone is sound, but the medium of phone adds to it this aspect of tactility, of touch, which itself might be more capable, more powerful than touch itself. Huddleston calls ASMR whispering the transubstantiation of touch through sound, creating a kind of equivalence between the two. The touch is transformed into sound and communicates as itself, but in audio form. But McLuhan and Nevitt, as, as a kind of counterpoint, quote the blind French author Jacques Luceron, who in his 1963 book And There Was Light writes, the voice can go farther than the hands or eyes in licit or illicit touch. For Luceron, and seemingly also McLuhan and Nevitt, who admittedly do their own fair share of overselling, the voice touch is or can be more than the touch touch. It's socially unregulated in the way body-to-body -body interactions are not. It can travel greater distances at greater speeds. It can, much like a phone call, collapse the very public and the very private. I can't help but make at least a passing comparison to the quality of the sound of most whispering videos and the sound of the classic old-school plastic landline telephone handset. Growing up, our landline handsets were always a little noisy, tinny, thin. Those piezo transducers packed into foam and stuffed inside a molded plastic shape produced a confident though fragile simulation of whoever was speaking at the other end, making them distant but no less crisp, compressed but present. I wonder how much the technology of ASMR, the sounds produced by the whisperers, vocal or otherwise, and this deeply buried nostalgia for the long-distance phone call to or from mom or some caring, benevolent third party for the audio tactile, all work in concert to produce this captivating, calming media. Calming even for people for whom it doesn't reach out and touch in that weird, hard-to-describe, tingly way. I have no answer, only a hunch that the presumption of sonic affect communicated by ASMR media, and long supported, as we've just talked about by our understanding of communication technology, might be doing more heavy lifting than it's ever given credit. All of this, I think, the ASMR and the whisperers, the triggering sounds, and their ability to counteract stress or anxiety, it all sort of flows nicely into all the empty spaces left by my confusion and potential misunderstanding about this idea of favorites, which, if you'll remember, is where we started this journey, like, forever ago. Maybe what I have trouble with is the idea of favorite sound referring to some particular bit of sonic experience that is the same or similar every time I hear it. And when I do, my brain goes, ah, yes, favorite sound. This seems so intellectual, 
when, as far as I experience it, at least, sound can be so, I'm, well, I guess, touching. This makes me wonder about what happens when we consider a favorite sound, not as a distinct audio experience, but rather a constantly evolving audio process. Meaning one has a favorite sound in the same way one has a sandwich or has fun at the beach. In a particular situation, those things touch, maybe literally, maybe not, and even become a part of us. But over time, they dissipate. They might inform some segment of our person, but after effect, they're no longer a single and concrete thing. They're a part of a very complex and ever-changing process running alongside all that other very complex stuff that makes us who we are. And so your favorite sound becomes the Snapple bottle opening, whenever that happens, and the rubbing of two pieces of paper together during those quiet moments you find yourself at home alone, and the soft voice of someone distant across an ocean of internet when you find yourself struggling to fall asleep or get out of bed. Whatever it is right now, however sure of it you are or not, if you are having a favorite sound, I'd love to know what it is, and I'm sure other reasonably sound listeners would too. If you can, make a recording of it and post it to Instagram. Tag it hash favorite SND. Who knows? Maybe you'll reach out and touch somebody. Yes. Mm-hmm.